Hey, Scott from MyGrowthRings.com. Here, here happens to be in a hotel room in Houston, Texas. But I have with me today somebody I'm super excited to uh, share the screen with and maybe even introduce you to, and that is Mr. Doug Reed. Uh, Doug is, uh, is an old former co-worker of mine from back in the days at ShopSmith. And uh, if, you, if you know him, you probably know him from his channel here on YouTube. And uh, not a week goes by that somebody doesn't say, hey, what's Doug up to? Or have you heard what's, what's going on with Doug? And uh, I, I recently answered that question yet again and thought, I'm going to reach out to Doug. And so uh, here we are, Doug. Thank you for coming on here and spending some time with me and, uh, and us. And uh, let me just throw it to you and, and ask, can you tell us a little about the, who is Doug Reed? Well, thank, thanks for that, Scott. And I appreciate the, the opportunity to come and talk to you like this. Uh, you know, usually when someone asks a question like that, I can talk to you for 12 hours about you know who I am. But real briefly, uh, I got involved with ShopSmith about 1987. I was the uh, time of my life when I needed to make some career changes, and I always knew I liked woodworking. And I had never heard of ShopSmith, but uh, somewhere along the line, I, I uh, discovered this company, went and saw a demonstration at the local store in Northern California. And uh, the, the guy showed me the tool and I had never seen it or heard of it. And I just was so gobsmacked that I said, uh, sh show me that again. And he went through the demo the second time. And before he was done with the demo the second time, I had ordered one. And uh, kind of like they say, the rest is history. I got it home. I found out I loved the tool. There was a whole lot more I could do with it than I even realized. And I had some dealings with the company and I liked them too. So I thought this would be a great place for me to go to work if possible. So I contacted them and it took me about a year to get on board with them, uh, but I did and I loved it. I was a demonstrator, traveled all over the US and my wife became a demonstrator as well and she traveled uh, with me too. So we, we had a great time with that. Uh, speaking of family, my, my kids, uh, both my daughters and my son are woodworkers. They grew up with these tools and that's, that's kind of a fun thing. I have a lot of photographs in those days as well. But uh, anyway, we did that and then uh, I became a traveling academy guy teaching uh, Smith woodworkers all over the US. Uh, ended up running that program for them. Um, then I got away from ShopSmith for a while, uh, mostly because I went into business with my brother in the cabinet refinishing and cabinet making business here in Louisville, Kentucky. Also, so, not not Northern California. No, not Northern California. No, I moved to, moved to uh, back to the Midwest to be near family. And anyway, we did that for a few years, but the, the timing was terrible because it was about 2006 when the economy was going <laughs> and no one wanted to spend any money on a kitchen remodel. So we got out of that after a couple of years. And uh, I happened to be talking to Bob Folkert back there at Chopsman. I said, you know, any uh, any interest in having me do some, some things for you? And he said, well, it's funny you would say that. <laughs> so he, uh, he asked me to do some videos for him. That worked out real well. And from there, I started doing videos, setting up my own YouTube channel. And that's been really fun and, and uh, productive for me. And then they asked me to do these webinars where uh, I have ShopSmith owners come in and uh, kind of kind of show them the tools. And to me, it's like I, I get to do the same thing I used to do in the demonstration and in the classes, but now I get to stay at home, which is really nice. I don't have to be on the road 250 nights a year, which is what but I used to do. You don't have to load a Mark V in and out of the, the ShopSmith van. Nice. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's worked out fine. I've had a great time with it. And, uh, yeah, that kind of takes me up to where I am today. Fantastic. I guess that was the one, the question, because people ask, because they, they think, well, the last time you put out a video on YouTube was some time ago. Yeah. You know, what, what, what has happened? And I always tell them, no, he's actively demonstrating, uh, typically through Zoom webinars. And I, I usually direct them on your channel, uh, the info page. You have, I think it's your email address or some contact information for folks who are interested. I know that, you know, the, the scope of what you're you're doing, you're not the customer service department for ShopSmith, then you're not the Q&A guy, but uh, you're certainly there to help people that are interested in buying tools, right? Absolutely. And, and I don't mind taking a question from, from anybody. I, I've always enjoyed ShopSmith woodworkers. But yeah, my primary function is to, uh, to get people involved in, in the ShopSmith system. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good thing to be able to do. Uh, I've met an awful lot of woodworkers over the years, and 99% uh, of them were just the nicest people in the world, so uh, I like that exchange. Yeah, I had that other guy in my class. <laughs> that 1%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably true. <laughs> uh, so, uh, now, but uh, 
you 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 mentioned eighty seven. That's when you bought your your Shopsmith tools. I started with the company in nineteen eighty seven. Coincidentally, had you been a woodworker up until that point, or were you just thinking about getting into woodworking at all at that stage? Uh, I was not a professional. You know, like a lot of guys, I took woodworking in junior high and high school, and really fell in love with it. And after that, it was just a just a kind of a hobby on and off over the years. But I ran into that situation, like so many of us have where uh, I was living in an apartment and didn't just didn't have any room for a shop. So that shop had really solved that problem for me. My uh, my first shop after I got the Mark V was, I think it was a maybe a nine by seven patio outdoors on the second floor. And I had my whole shop out there and I was able to do a whole lot of woodworking there, which uh, nice. I, I couldn't do today. And fortunately today, I'm, I'm really fortunate. I've got a nice, about 700 square feet, I guess, of shop here. Um, but I, I still have my shop smith and still enjoy it. That's fantastic. Yeah, you know, I, I had a shop in a third bedroom of a second story apartment for a while. <laughs> shop smith, shop with Mark V and a dust collector in that space. And I used it. <laughs> yeah, you know how that is. And yes, I do. All right. So, um, you know, part of the, the reason why I wanted to connect with you was I put out a video recently in response to um, a comment that Roy Underhill made on um, the Steve Ramsey, I think the, the woodworking show, I think he calls it, it's a, a podcast. And he mentioned a old infomercial that Shopsmith had where, as he said it, the skill is in the tool. Um, not, not exactly word for word what it said, but I, I mentioned that I kind of bristled when I was an academy instructor because part of my living, what well, all of my living was coming from helping people learn how to utilize the equipment that they had purchased. In some cases, they were considering purchasing and they came to take a class first. And um, you know, it's, it's been interesting, the response to that. I think most people recognize that you know, the, the tools are part of the equation, but the tool can't do it without us and we can't do it without a, a degree of knowledge. And, that, and so I thought it might be fun to ask you, if, first off, did you see that or are you familiar with that infomercial I'm talking about? And what do you think about statements like that where, you know, the, the skill is in the tool or the expertise is in the tool? Yeah, I, I watched your uh, I watched your recent presentation of that. I, I don't think I'd seen that. But I probably have seen it before. I've seen all those old videos. But, yeah, that was one of the things we were kind of taught to say. Uh, you know, we did a, a can presentation uh, in the demos. And that was one of the things we had to overcome was people's fear about, well, am I going to be able to use it? And I'm going to be able to you know, make some nice things out of it. So that idea that the expertise was in the in the tool was something uh, they promoted back then. And while there, you know, there's certainly an awful lot of truth to what you just said. Uh, I, I personally think that it's a combination. You have to have the person and the tool. I've met guys that could build fine furniture with a vice grip and a rock, you know, just. <laughs> And then I've met guys that has every tool you can possibly imagine and, and couldn't make a, a square box to save their life. It's just the combination of the two, I guess. But uh, I was telling you a moment ago, on the sign that I came across in uh, fine woodworking a few years ago, and I'll read it to you. It says, it kind of pertains to what we're talking about. Machine joinery is not a convenience of compromise, but is a contemporary option made possible by the tools of our age and it requires as much skill and art, or skill, excuse me, skill and attention to detail as any hand method. So you get both sides of that story, and, and uh, I think they're both true. You know, I, for me personally, I just like having the tools. I, I, you know, I'll come down here sometimes and just rub them. You know, just <laughs> I relate to that. I know exactly what you're saying. So I guess maybe, all right, so that, that leads me to a question. What are your thoughts? I know you kind of have a dog in the fight here, so let's let it, we'll, we'll temper sure. temper this. What are your thoughts on Shopsmith tools? Wow, uh, that yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I think the Shopsmith tools, you know, was, was a brilliant invention. Um, I had the opportunity to meet one of the original founders of the company, a guy named uh, Bob Chambers, and uh, he and his brother, and the actually I guess the original inventor, a guy named Hans Goldsmith. That started the company, and when you think about what they accomplished back then, at the end of World War II, and the guys were coming back from the war, they were buying homes in the GI Bill, and most of those homes were little little houses with little uh, garages. So this tool fit in perfectly, 
and uh, it, it worked extremely well. I mean, they were they were very very successful with it. And you know, another kind of comment on the quality of the tools, and I'm sure you'll see this as well. Uh, I still get guys today that have tools, shopsmith tools that are 50, 60 years old, and you know, I got it from my dad, and he got it from his dad, and it's still running like a champ. So I think they built really quality tools. Uh, you know, there's always going to be pros and cons to anything. And one of the things that I, I get concerned about with all of that is guys start using a tool without having any idea what they're doing. And Chopsmith provides really good manuals and there's a ton of videos out there. But uh, a guy jumps in and, and tries to use the tool without, you know, even know how to set it up or make a cut. Uh, then he's going to be online complaining about the tool's no good. So, you know, that happens as well. But I think the tools are, uh, the, the quality of the tool, the accuracy of the tool, um, if you set it up and align it properly and keep it in good shape, is as good as anything you're going to find out there. And they are, seem to be pretty much bulletproof. They just last and last and last. So, uh, yeah. And the, the other complaint you'll hear, a question, I guess, is people say, well, it takes too long to do changeovers. When I was doing demonstrations, we always got the knucklehead that was walking by saying, oh, it's a great tool, but it takes you forever to do a changeover. Well, that kind of will, will put a cold water on your demonstration. Yeah. So I thought, I've got to come up with a way to address that. So, so what I did, I said, excuse me, sir, <laughs> come over here a minute. I said, how long do you think it takes to change from any one tool to the other? And he'd say, oh, 10, 15 minutes probably. I said, okay. I said, do you have a watch on? Yeah, I got a watch. Okay. I said, yeah. Name a tool, start with that, and then tell me when to go and change it from any one tool to the other tool, 60 seconds time. And they were gobsmacked, of course, because nobody just you know knew that you could do that. But they were so beautifully engineered for that reason that, uh, yeah, that changeover, I just don't think it's an issue at all. Yep. I've always thought of that as uh, quality time with my tools. I mean, I get, I get to convert my table saw to a drill press. You know, let, let's see you do that, Mr. Sears Craftsman <laughs> table saw owner, you know? Although Delta, if you recall, had the Delta shop where you bolted, you bolted the drill press to the edge of your table saw, you took the blade off, put a pulley in its place, and then you ran a belt up from the, the slot in the table up and over some more pulleys to your drill press. So that was their response to the shopsmith. You talk, talk about changeover. <laughs> I've yeah. never seen that one, but that's, that's kind of fun to hear about that. The, the, on the other hand, you know, a guy that has never really seen one working, he looks at that thing and say, boy, that's complicated. And it's going to take forever to set it up and change it. And I think that's why shopsmith uh, had to go with demonstrators all over the country to really show people what it could do. And uh, because they, they will tell you back at shopsmith that if, if people can't see it work, they're not going to buy it. Uh, so that worked out really well for them until it just became crazy expensive to keep people out on the road like that. But uh, yeah, the, now we've got the videos on YouTube, so we don't have to have the live demonstrations so much anymore. Yeah. yeah what, what are your thoughts on the fact that there are a whole bunch of videos on YouTube and a number of people producing videos? And, and tomorrow there'll be more. I think it's a good thing. I mean, most of us, I think, by this time can look at a video and within a minute know if it's quality or not and whether or not you want to keep watching it. And uh, there's some good ones. And not to stroke you too much, but I think you have just about the best video uh, site out there now for Shopsmith and Shopsmith owners. I think I highly recommend that I tell everybody to, to check out Scott. So, um, yeah, but I think it's great. And, you know, in all the videos I've looked at, there's only been one that really just irritated me to no end. Guy got on there and he made a response. I think it was a reply to one of my videos, and he he show, holds up this nubbin of a finger. So you know, and, and he says, "This is cause the shops and the joiners junk." I said, "Oh no no no." So anyway, you know, delving into it a little bit more, found out he didn't have the guard on at all, didn't know how to use it, and he was joining. He was doing a bevel cut with the fence tilted the opposite direction. Well, you can see what's going to happen. And uh, yeah. you know, I tried as nicely as I could say. Well, you know, if, if you'd have read the manuals or had all the parts of the tool, that would have never happened. But I didn't want to get into a, you know, right, argument right. with the guy. But, uh, yeah, I would say 98% of everybody that I've ever talked to that owns a Shopsmith really likes them. People that don't like Shopsmith are the ones that never use them. That's pretty, <laughs> That's pretty so universal. True. That is so true. Yeah, that, I've, I've run into that, too. Uh, the people that seem to be just dead set against it and that whole comment about it takes too long to change over, that tells me this is somebody who doesn't know how to set it up. That's right. Uh, the, the one thing I will say, and, and, and I'll, I'll admit this to people, is they'll, they'll say, well, what do you do You know, when you, you get done making your cuts and you go to the drill press and then you realize, oh, I've got one more piece I forgot to cut? 
And I, and the only thing I can say to that is, well, you learn to not do that. But like you just mentioned, you're only a minute away from your table saw. Sure. Right. So you can, you can get it set up again quickly enough, but uh, that is enough of a hassle that it, my Mark five helped me organize my, my production uh, in my shop for that very reason. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they always say you got to plan your work and I think that's true. But the other part of that is, I mean, that can happen with any, any tools. Um, but I always tell people, if it's important, make an extra piece, you know, cut an extra spare piece. And <laughs> you can have it there if you need it. That's actually a really good suggestion. One of the, the recent videos that I did, um, a, a guy whose channel uh, is called Woodshop Nerdery. Have you seen Tom do no. any of his videos with his shop smith? Uh, suggest to check it out, Woodshop Nerdery. His, his, um, his approach is so different than mine. He's, he's very technically minded and very much like an engineer and uh, he loves doing a lot of testing. And I, I think that his channel is fantastic. And I did a video announcing the new Shopsmith Mark IV and invited him to join me for the follow-up Q&A uh, session because I know that he was interested in, in is, is, is interested in all things Shopsmith. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Did, did you know about that machine? And what do you think the, the where does it fit? Yeah, um, when I first heard of it, I thought, well, this was kind of going backwards. You know, why are they, why are they going? Because they've always gone bigger and better all the time. But the Mark IV is, is a little bit smaller. Uh, but that sort of makes sense for people that has a you know real space issue. Um, the concept is different too, though. Rather than including all the different parts and pieces for the different functions, uh, they kind of start you off with a you know a bare unit, I guess you could say, and then you can add whatever functions that you want to that. And I see an advantage there is that you, you know if you don't ever want to do any turning, you don't have to invest in all the turning stuff. So uh, that that sort of makes sense. You know, I was thinking about that before I met with you today because. Uh, and how, you know, how can you kind of explain that to people? Well, to me, it's like a lawn tractor, you know, or I buy the basic lawn tractor, which is a motor and a frame and the wheels, but there's all kinds of stuff I can add to that, depending upon how I want, you know, what I want to do with it. And uh, that, that's kind of what's going on with a Mark IV. So, uh, yeah, I like the idea. Um, and I'd be curious to see how it does in sales. I really don't know. Yeah. Are you going to get one in your shop, the demo? Um, I'm going to ask Shopsmith to send me one. Uh, yeah. To, you know, just like you said, I, I need to play with this. So I can be, you know, a little bit more informed on it. And then I'll probably start doing some uh, videos on it. Yeah. Or, or some webinars. Cause I'm curious about, because it's footprint is, is shorter. I'm curious, where does that put the headstock and the drill press position? But I know when I hold my, when I move my Mark five up into the drill press, the headstock's not all the way at the top. It's right. some distance down from the top. So you can see how that might work. Um, you know, Shopsmith has made all kinds of tools and not every one of those tools is still in production. Is there a, a out of production Shopsmith tool that you wish were still available for folks? Hmm. Not, nothing comes to mind. Um, in, in some ways, I think it's there, there's products that they make. It's too bad that people don't know about them because they're really nice products. Such as? Like, like, like the conical sander. I think it's a dandy tool, you know, but yeah. guys look at that thing and say, well, what the heck is this? It's a sander that's not flat. Uh, but right. you know, I, I, I've actually got some videos in the can on a mechanical sander, but I, yeah. I, I would like to at some point do specific videos on each of the different accessories just to show them that, you know, there's so many things about the shopsmith that you're not going to know or understand unless you really see it demonstrated. So yeah, uh, that's something interesting. I have to think about that one. If there's something that, uh, I wish they still had in production. Um, maybe the radial arm saw. I, I, that was kind of oh the saw smith. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, and then the saw smith two thousand too. Oh, <laughs> I, I no, don't that, think we need to go go back to that. <laughs> no, no. You know, I actually think we'd have sold a, a, sold a ton of those, but we couldn't travel with them. They were just too darn big to move in and out of the van. So, uh, but yeah, but the, the I had one of the radial arm saws for a while, and I gave it away, and I'm kind of sorry that I did. I have three of them. Do you? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yes, I have. I have three different uh, generations of it, and not not that there were decades between those generations. But I have a Magna Engineering, I have a Yuba, and I have a Magna American hmm. version. 
and uh, in each each in different de degrees of uh, functionality. But I have them. I haven't done anything with them except for possess them. Yeah, <laughs> I understand how that is. Which is a problem. <laughs> are, there, are there tools that you would like to see them uh, bring back? I, I very much enjoyed the um, the router system with the overarm pin router. Um, I, I I think especially as people are now getting interested in CNC equipment, mm -hmm. and they see the value of of being able to do some mass production of similar parts, the template routing that you can do with that pin router is achievable. You don't have to go learn how to run a computer like you do if you get into CNC. And I think for a lot of a lot of home woodworkers, really, the the way that they would ultimately uh, utilize a CNC machine, much of that they could do with that pin router. That's a great and, point. And, and then as it appeared before they tried to incorporate it into the Mark V, the, the last version of it with the the uh, beneath table router table system and so on, that's just a fantastic combination. The one thing that I added to mine that I, I thought would have been a great stock item was I added a, a big stop collar to uh, the, the base of the column and I gave myself, uh, replaced the nut and bolt that, that connected the yoke at the back with a, um, a lever. Mm -hmm. And so I could quickly release it and swing the arm out of the way, but it didn't drop. Okay. And then bring it back into position very quickly and lock it. And uh, that really helped me utilize both of those functions both overhead and beneath the table hmm. um, people have asked me what do you think about mounting a router table to your mark five and yes it can be done and if your if your shop space is small enough maybe you want to do that but i for um, it's not just because of the mark five i had a powermatic table saw that had a router table built into the extension and one tool is always in the way of the other tool. Hmm. Your, your, the, the router table or the router bit being exposed is always an issue when you go to use the saw and vice versa. And so I happen to like having a router table as a standalone tool. But the advantage of it on the Mark V is it's, it's perfect at whatever height you're comfortable, right? You can adjust sure. the height just so. Sure. And because it is over on the extension side, it's typically not in the way of the other functions that you're performing. I don't know. What are your thoughts of the Shopsmith mounted router table? I have seen some guys that have made their own up and, and it's, you know, they're, they're, they look pretty nice. I've got some people have sent me plans for them. Um, now, Shopsmith made one, if I recall now, was that made by Anchor maybe that had the, the router table as an option that you could put on your Shopsmith? Does that sound familiar? I. I don't think it was made by Inkra, but I know that they designed it around the Inkra gauge. So there were inserts in the table that were designed specifically for mounting the Inkra gauge. Well, you know, Inkra had that high-end uh, fence system. Uh, yes. Uh, and that, that was working with the router, and that, that's a pretty nice system, too. But, uh, yeah, I can see the benefit of having that. Um, never tried it, but, yeah, I can see that. I can see at least two Inkra tools hanging on your wall behind you there. Yes, I, li I like Ingrid tools. I have the, the miter gauge um, and the big sliding sled, big table. And what else do I have back there? I've got, oh, I've got the device for making uh, finger joints, finger lap joints. So they're, they're good quality products, I think. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Um, I also see you've got the brackets over there over your right shoulder um, for adding the floating tables either in front of or directly behind the main table on your Mark V. Do you like that? Is that if you, when would you use that versus any other configuration you might use with the tables? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I kind of like to have everything that they make, so I got those, <laughs> and they and they work fine. Uh, you know, primarily for doing long rip cuts, it seems to me is their their real benefit. But I can set up the tables of the Mark Seven, the four piece table system, and do the same thing. So. Yeah. I keep forgetting there's a seven. I keep thinking Mark five. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped at five. <laughs> and just looking at my wall here, let's see, I've got the shaper fence. I've got the miter pro, which is kind of a nice tool. 
bandsaw, joiner, belt sander, planer. Strip sander. Strip sander, yeah. Is the is the pro planer in production right now? Uh, no, they they they're offering the uh, the mark mounted one again. Okay. And apparently, with the Mark Seven and the Power Pro headstock, it performs a lot better than it did before. Uh, sure. You got more power, but also the way that you feed it is is more intuitive instead of feeding it from the back side of the machine. But when they first came out with that, the Power Pro, they, they did a test on that and they put that planer on there, and they jointed a bunch of a uh, bunch of oak. I think it was maybe 10 inch wide oak and they ran a full mile of oak through that thing and didn't hiccup at all. So it was, it does a nice job. I mean, that's a very good point. Um, when I saw that they had the, the Mark mounted planer, I thought, you know, I never did care for that. I like the pro planer, but you're right with the power pro headstock that, that kind of answers most of the issues. You know, um, the other thing is I'm not getting younger and lifting things <laughs> up and off of that machine is not that much fun. I, although I think it was maybe a hands-on magazine where they showed a customer built uh, a storage rack that the, uh, the the Mark mounted planer sat on the rack and it slid up to the head, to the, uh, to the Mark V and there was no real lifting involved or just kind of slide it off onto the tubes. So it was a, a good idea. Yeah, you know, speaking of that lifting, one of the things that has been really popular is that lift assist for putting it up in the drill press mode. And that's, you yes. know, I never thought that the drill press was a big, heavy lift, but boy, it sure is popular. Well, I have one of those, and I, I, I need to have a rotator cuff surgery, and it helps me. Yeah, it's a big, big help. So, um, not sure how much woodworking you're doing these days, but what, if you were to, you know, take some time and just just for Doug and go do something in your shop. Do you gravitate towards the lathe? Do you like building shop fixtures and jigs or what, what do you like to do in the shop? Turning bowls, bowl turning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to me, it's a perfect combination of, of, of skill and precision, but also being able to be creative with your hands. You're not really relying on the machine to, you know, to, to make the shape and whatever. And uh, I just always have found that very, very relaxing. It's, uh, and, and, you know, people love getting them as gifts and they always say the same thing. Did you make that? <laughs> Do you use a chuck for that? Or are you mounting on a face plate or what? I, I, I use coach? chucks almost exclusively now. I mean, I, I have, occasionally will use a face plate, but I like the, uh, precision chucks, the four jaw chucks. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And I got into using the, uh, carbide tools here a couple of years back and, uh, they got some real benefits to them as well. Uh, you know. Do you, do you uh, ever look at that uh, website called Stumpy Nubs? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I like his stuff. And he did one recently I saw on, you know, comparing the, uh, the carbide to the traditional tools. And I, I tend to agree with him. That I wish I wish I'd have known about carbide from the beginning, though. I probably have 75 tools hanging on my wall, chisels, you know, lathe chisels, that, that uh, I don't need 90% of them. But they're, they're fun. They're satisfying. Since you've dealt with a lot of wannabe woodworkers and, and serious woodworkers that were exploring shopsmith tools, who do you think is the ideal candidate for a tool like the shopsmith system? Another, another great question. It's very interesting how things have changed over the years. When I started with shopsmith back many years ago, uh, the average owner was, well, he was, he was married, he was a homeowner. He wanted to do DIY stuff. He'd always kind of dreamed of doing this, uh, and and that's that's the guy that was doing it. And usually in the you know early late thirties, early forties, something like that. Today, most of the guys that I deal with are guys that are uh, you know retiring or getting ready to retire, and they're saying, "I've always wanted one of these. I you know never had the time, didn't have the money, and now you know I used to see these in the mall with my dad, and I finally got the, the ability to do it." And that's the guy that seems to be really satisfied now. He's got the time, got the money. And uh, yeah, that's, I'm guessing that's 80% of everybody I deal with now. Now you, you say guy, you're not being sexist here, are you? I mean, well, that's I just know. a reality. <laughs> yeah. it, no, that's, you know, that's a, that's something we're seeing in increasing, but not as much as we thought we would. Um, we, we, when Susan joined the company, that was one of the things that we promoted that we, you know, we, if they see her doing it, she, she's a, you know, petite woman. And uh, if they see her doing it, maybe they'll get interested in doing it as well. But it, it 
didn't catch on as fast as I thought that it would, but it's, it's increasing, and that is nice to see. And as I mentioned earlier, I've got two daughters that are woodworkers, so I've contributed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, you, Susan was in a video or two, wasn't she? She was, yeah. She did one on the original, uh, when the 510 came out. She did one, in fact, with Mike Young, showing how to set it up, uh, taking it out of the box and, and putting it all together. And, uh, and she does some videos on my channel as well. She's done some sharpening videos and things like that. But, yeah, she, she still gets down here and works with me occasionally. Very good. I'll uh, I'll track one of those videos down and link it in the video description so folks can, can meet Susan too. Well, uh, thank you very much for spending some time with me, Doug. I really appreciate it. I'm sure my subscribers are going to appreciate meeting you. Um, I will link to your channel. Uh, I would encourage folks as they, they check out your channel not to just subscribe and, and wait for new content. There's a ton of useful content. And um, I would say that the things that you're sharing don't really age because those those tools still exist, they're still available. And even if uh, a tool that you've shown isn't in production any longer, doesn't mean that people aren't gonna still come across them. So um, I would encourage folks to check out your back catalog. And it sounds like you say you, there's a promise of some new content, so that's exciting. Yeah, I'm looking, look, really looking forward to it. You know, as you, as you do these things, you realize you can get better at it. That's both the woodworking, but also the video, making the videos and then editing and getting them out there. Uh, and I, some of those I go back and look at and I really cringe, so I <laughs> redo them. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to keep it posted when I do that, Scott. Fantastic, I look forward to it. Thank you All right, so well, much. that's it. That's it. Um, thank you for your time. And uh, we'll I don't know again. how to end this. I don't know how to end this, Doug. Well, <laughs> you ever get to Louisville, Kentucky, come by and see me. Very, very good. I, I will do that for sure. Okay. All right. Take Make care. Have a great day. Bye now. Bye-bye.